Good morning. Thanks for being here this morning. Got another exciting presentation for you, but we will get started with a reflection. This is called Destined or Determined. A skydiving instructor was asked, how many successful jumps must a student make before he or she can become certified? He answered, all of them. Skydiving, however, is the exception. Is your life built on a series of successes? Do you usually attempt something new and immediately succeed, then succeed again and again? Or more likely, do you find that it's the other way around? Our successes are often built on smaller failures. We fell off the bike a few times before we learned to ride. We, and we produced a few culinary failures before we baked a successful layer cake or prepared, a, uh, or prepared a satisfactory omelet. Tom Hopkins observes, the number of times I succeed is in direct proportion to the number of times I fail and keep on trying. And Winston Churchill stated, success is going from failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm. They both agree that discouragement, rather than failure, is the enemy of success. Those who remain hopeful and focused, though they fail, are those who will eventually succeed. In all, Emily Dickinson is said to have written nearly 1,800 poems, though fewer than a dozen were published in her lifetime, and the first volume of her poetry was not published until four years after her death. Emily Dickinson's, Emily Dickinson's success is attributed to the fact that she did not allow discouragement to keep her from her poetry. As she wrote so beautifully, hope is a thing with feathers that perches in the, so in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Hope never stops. Where would we be today had Emily Dickinson lost her enthusiasm for writing? Though largely unrecognized, she kept her desire alive, and we now remember her as one of the great poets of all time. It's good to remember that success may, not, may, just, may just be beyond the next failure, and you'll get there, not because you're destined to, but because you're determined to. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself this morning. Holly Brenner, I'm the Vice President of Strategic Development and Marketing. I see many familiar faces here this morning, but welcome back and welcome if you're a first time visitor. We're glad to have you here. We do have Dr. Schaefer here with us this morning. He's a board certified plastic surgeon with Ignatian Healthcare Plastic Surgery and Cosmetic Services. Due to the nature of the topic today, some of the imagery that you'll see is a little more explicit than we normally show. So if that is offensive or makes you uncomfortable, please either just look away or if you do need to step out, we understand that. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Schaefer this morning. He's going to enlighten us on some of the options that are available for self-improvement through cosmetic surgery and as well as some less invasive procedures as well. So Dr. Schaefer. Good morning uh, and thanks for having me. Um, so there's a lot of slides that we're going to kind of go through. Uh, we'll probably go pretty quick at times. Um, you know, it's a pretty formal looking presentation, but I'm, I can be a pretty f informal sort of person. So if you have a question at any time, just raise your hand. I'm happy to ask, answer it at any time. Um, <clears throat> so uh, as Holly said, I, I'm uh, Rick Schaefer. I work uh, for Agnesian uh, Healthcare at the uh, Fond du Lac, Ripon, and Wapan locations. So I do see patients in all three of those areas. My principal um, office is on South Main Street, and uh, I operate every week at the hospital and at the surgery center here in town, and then intermittently at the other two hospitals. So I think, uh, you know, defining what plastic surgery is is perhaps uh, the most important thing because uh, the press sort of makes you think we do one thing, and we do a lot more than just that. Um, I mean, all you have to do is look at any of the sort of magazines that end up in a, a variety of the waiting rooms around the clinics, and, and you think that all we do is, is try to make people look more like Justin Bieber or something like that. Um, but uh, simply defined, uh, plastic surgery is, is surgery of the skin and all of its contents. Um, and, and I think because we do so much as plastic surgeons, sometimes um, it, it's not only hard to define, but it makes it hard to advertise for, it makes it hard to promote because you know, we, we do so many different things. How do you sort of, um, you know, put an ad in, in a paper or something like that that describes all these things? So uh, craniofacial surgery is one of the things that, that certainly plastic surgeons do. And the most, uh, I think, easy example that we've all seen and heard of is cleft lip and palate surgery. Uh, we do uh, hand surgery, uh, ranging from carpal tunnel surgery to finger replantation microsurgery, which is when we move one part of the uh, patient's body to another part. Transplant surgery actually was started uh, in the field of plastic surgery, and Joe Murray was a, uh, a Nobel uh, Prize winner for medicine, and he won his Nobel Prize in medicine in 1990, but it was his work in 1954 when he performed the first successful kidney transplant 
um, that uh, transplant surgery was sort of born out of plastic surgery, and that is still true today. In some training programs, the plastic surgeons are intimately involved in some of the organ transplants, and, and now face transplants and um, hand transplants, double arm transplants are being done, all under the guise of plastic surgery. And then we have cosmetic surgery, which is, again, I think, the popular culture interpretation of everything we do, um, things from facelifts to tummy tuck. Uh, dermatologic surgery, again, you know, surgery of the skin and all of its content, so a lot of what goes wrong with the skin is skin cancer, and uh, I do quite a bit of that. Uh, another sort of subfield is oculoplastic surgery, which is just a fancy way of saying we work around the eyelids. And then burn surgery is certainly another thing that we do. So let's talk a little bit about the cosmetic side of the arena for a little while. We'll talk about aging. You know, why do we age? Um, we have muscles on our face that cause um, our skin to fold. And as that skin folds over and over again, it, it produces wrinkles. Um, and wrinkling is certainly a sign of aging. We also have volume loss. So what was once full starts to become deflated. Uh, the best analogy is sort of a natural, uh, you know, grape to a raisin. You know, as that happens, the amount of skin on the grape doesn't change, uh, but the volume inside it starts to sh shrink. And as that happens, then the the, the textural surface of the of the skin of the grape turns uh, wrinkly like a raisin. Um, there are skin changes that occur. Um, textural changes, loss of elasticity, again leading to wrinkling, and sun damage. And then there's gravitational changes that occur as well, causing downward drift. So here's just a, a, a slide showing a, a youthful woman on one side and an aging woman on the other side, and how we have uh, the wrinkling that's occurring around the periorbital area. We have gravitational descent of the cheek mass that used to be high starts to sort of slide off the face and, and you start to see wrinkling and uh, uh, contour changes at the nasal labial fold, at the corners of the mouth and to the marionette lines. A smooth jaw line gets this uh, jowling here um, and there's certainly volume loss in the temple. So these are all areas that um, either with one procedure, two procedures, six procedures, you know, you can adjust each one of these problems for a patient and sort of you have to identify what the problem is for them and how you can best address that. Again, um, you know, the muscles, um, repeated skin folds cause wrinkles. And so, um, and here are just uh, a cartoon of some of the facial muscles, these muscles that are around the eye um, that cause crow's feet to occur would be an area that we might put some some Botox in. You know, I, I like to think of skin as a fabric, okay? So if you took a piece of paper and you folded it in half, you'd see a, a wrinkle in that paper. But if you smooth it out with your hand, you can sort of push that wrinkle out and you don't really see it. But the more and more you fold that piece of paper in that same location, that, that, uh, that uh, fold gets etched into the fabric of the paper that is sort of um, no longer removable at one point. And the same thing happens with your skin. So your skin gets folded by these muscles of your face and when that happens in the beginning, you, know, you don't really notice it, but over and over uh, time, uh, decades, uh, that, that folding starts to get etched into the fabric of your skin and you start to see that. We see that um, in between the eyebrows in the area we call the glabella. We see it up in the forehead with transverse wrinkling. We see that in the crow's feet region. So uh, let's talk a little bit about Botox. So Botox temporarily stops dynamic wrinkling, and the dynamic wrinkling is occurring when those muscles are actively moving. It's not a permanent treatment. It lasts about three to four months, and the cost is about $200 to $800 per treatment, depending on how many areas and how much you take. Um, Botox is a protein. Again, it relaxes muscles. It was originally FDA approved to treat the area that we call the glabella, which is, again, the area in between your eyebrows. Here's a picture of a lady scowling. She gets those 11s that we see up in the eyebrow area. Here she is trying to scowl after her Botox has taken effect. And so that's the sort of benefit is that those, the, the thing that's pretty amazing about Botox in my mind is a couple of things. One is that so um, during the time that the Botox is active, you're not able to make your wrinkles worse. During the time the Botox is active, um, the wrinkles that you have etched into the fabric of, you, of your skin um, are getting better. So it sort of depends on how young you are when you start Botox treatment, if you decide to do it. Um, 
So if your goal is to never get wrinkles in this area as a young um, person, you can essentially never get etching into this area if you're just good about getting intermittent Botox. Uh, here's a male with the same problem. You see his are a little bit more prominent, and here he is trying to skull afterwards. Now, interestingly, when you compare his before to his after, um, these lines are still there. And those lines are still there because he's, you see he's got gray hair. He's a little older. So, so these, um, these lines have been etched into the fabric of his skin, and so he's sort of uh, starting late, if you will. So the good news is he's getting older over time, and these are getting um, no worse or better over time, but they're still there. Uh, if you want to completely get rid of them, you'd have to do some other treatments to that area. Um, in 2004, uh, the American Society of Plastic Surgeons uh, talked uh, about what we call a consensus statement, which is other areas that are effectively treated with Botox. So again, medications are FDA approved for one thing, and then doctors use them, what we call off-label for other things. The best example I can come up with to demonstrate that is that if an antibiotic is brought onto the market to, to treat strep throat, um, it sort of has a, an FDA approval for that, and then that same streptococcal organism maybe causes a soft tissue infection somewhere else in a patient's body, and then a doctor might prescribe it for that reason. So it was originally intended for strep throat, but yet it has other clinical uses and indications because the physician using it sort of has that clinical knowledge of pharmacology and, and uh, anatomy and physiology and, and applies that knowledge appropriately. Same thing here with Botox. So again, FDA originally approved for glabellar lines and then a uh, consensus statement by the Society of Plastic Surgeons in 04 that said you can actually use it, you know, fo forehead, crow's feet, neck, lips, nose, brows, and you have to use it appropriate in the appropriate doses and, and in the appropriate locations for the right patients. And there's reasons why I might not give a patient Botox. Not everybody should really be getting it, I guess. Uh, uh, in my mind, um, if you're pregnant or you're lactating, you shouldn't get it. There's no safety data to say that it's um, safe, and there's certainly no data to say it's harmful, but I, I would say it's, it's probably not a good idea. Um, so here's an example of forehead um, lines. So here she is, uh, raising her eyebrows, a fairly young-looking lady, has transverse rides across the forehead, <clears throat> and, you know, good news is, you know, people say, oh, you're going to have a paralyzed face. No, you don't have a paralyzed face. You can still raise your eyebrows, but your forehead doesn't wrinkle like that. Sort of nice. Crow's feet, same thing. <clears throat> you see the, the crow's feet here, certainly a lot better. I don't think this is the greatest picture because she's not really actively smiling, so I'll show you this picture instead. <clears throat> He's got a nice uh, crow's foot uh, demonstration here. He's got a good smile here, a nice smile, no crow's feet. Definitely a, an overall improvement. Um, <clears throat> And I'm sure in the summertime you, you see friends who look like this. Maybe they're a touch older, a little bit more severity in their crow's feet. Maybe they're a golfer. They spend a lot of time squinting, and you can actually see their tan lines in and out of their, their, uh, their, their crow's feet there, which is definitely a telltale sign of, of too much sun exposure and aging and no Botox. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so some bands in the neck um, that we can treat as well. Okay. Let's go on to volume loss. So each problem that we encounter sort of has its own separate solution. And you can combine these things to get a synergistic effect. You can do one, you can do multiple. Just depends on what the patient wants or needs. <clears throat> so, what, so volume loss. Um, uh, restoring volume by plumping up an area that's deflated over time is the goal. Uh, the principal fillers that we use in the office uh, last approximately a year. Uh, they uh, come pre-filled as a syringe, so the syringe that you buy is yours, and uh, I don't share syringes between patients, of course, and so uh, it's sort of like a can of Coke analogy, I like to say. So if you're thirsty for a sip of Coke, you have to open a can to get there. If you're really thirsty and you need 16 ounces, you have to open two cans to get there. Same thing with the syringes of filler. So we open one syringe for the first price of $5.99, and as we go on, we open secondary and tertiary syringes as needed. You can also fill a uh, patient's face with their own fat. Um, the problem with that is, is that it's certainly a lot more expensive to do so. You have to harvest fat from another part of their body, which results in a donor site pain. Um, and 
fat isn't as reliable as what comes pre-filled in the syringe. Um, I suppose the upside to fat is that it can be very long-lasting, whereas the fillers are very short-lasting. Um, nice thing about fillers, though, uh, you know, if you don't like the treatment, it's going to go away. Once the fat's there, there's really no taking it out. So the principal fillers that are used uh, across uh, the states are Juvederm and Restylane. They're essentially uh, analogous products. You know, you'll see people advertising why one is so much better than the other. It's like Coke and Pepsi. They're both pretty good. They're, um, <clears throat> it's just a personal preference, really. This is, uh, these are injected in the office. It's an uh, office procedure. You're awake. Uh, we use ice and uh, to minimize any discomfort. We numb the area up before we work on it, kind of like the dentist might. The area that Restylane was originally um, <clears throat> FDA approved for is this area in here called the nasal labial fold. And so here's before and after. Here's a more perhaps easy to see example, nasal labial folds here and after. It's not that they're completely gone, but they're definitely a improved. Here's another example of the same thing, before nasal labial folds and after. Gentlemen, same problem, you know, e even out here getting some really nice improvement. One more example here. We'll just go through these quickly. All right, here we go, down to the lips. So, you know, oftentimes we'll see this, what we call, refer to as a barcode deformity. We often see barcode deformities on uh, former smokers. So a lot of vertical lip lines in the upper lip and lower lip. And <clears throat> so we can sort of fill not necessarily every individual line that you see, although you can do a little bit of that. The principle is basically putting in a little lip liner. Um, under the skin with this filler and it pushes those lines out. Doesn't make her lips look overtly large, but it's definitely an improvement when you compare it to the before and after. <clears throat> For those people who want more full lips, we certainly do that and, and the lips do thin significantly in the fifth through eighth decades of life. Uh, here you can put it in the glabella. So if someone like this came into my office, you know, this might be something that you'd put a little Botox in so this doesn't get worse, but you also might want to fill this because with Botox on board, it's still going to look like this. If you just fill it, the, the muscular action of this area will um, push the product out of this crease faster than if you um, uh, don't do that. Here's another oblique shot of the glabella, the area in between the eyebrows again. You can you can put some of this product really in a variety of areas around the face. Uh, it has tremendous impact along the infraorbital rim, where a lot of people get a lot of hollowing, certainly starting in their 40s and 50s. Nasal labial folds, as you see here, corners of the mouth, definite improvement. We can add some volume to the cheek as well. And here's a, a nice frontal example of that sort of treatment. Um, really, just the whole face, uh, around the eyes, in the nasal labial folds, at the corners of the mouth, make the lips a little fuller, cheek volume. Uh, you know, it just makes her look like her uh, younger twin sister. <laughs> and same thing here. So we have skin changes that occur as well. And there are textural changes, loss of elasticity, and sun damage. And um, sun protection is by far and away the most important thing that you can do to make yourself look better. You know, um, if you start, well, the younger you start, obviously the better. The better you are at it, the better. And um, there's good clinical data to suggest that if you do nothing else, if this is the only thing you do for the way you look, you will look a lot better 10 years later. 20 years later, 30 years later. Sun protection, sun protection, sun protection. Um, you know, the, even, even the, the minimal amount that you get going from your house to the car and in and out of the hospital and everything else, it just adds up over time as photo damage that will um, essentially be irreversible to some extent. Um, you know, simple skin care starts with cleansing. You don't have to do anything outrageous and scrubs or anything. Just you want to gently remove the grease, dust, makeup, and sweat of the day. 
You want to hydrate your skin. There are a variety of agents out there, moisturizers, occlusive agents, and um, you know, there's a billion dollar industry out there that sells these products to you. I'd say that the products that you can buy at the store today are a lot better than what you could buy 10 years ago and certainly a whole lot better than what you can buy 20 years ago. There are some products that are not available at, at really sufficient strengths, uh, but that you can get in better strengths if you go through your physician. The um, alpha hydroxy acids as a, as, a category, as a category of drugs, you'll see some of these uh, acids, glycolic acid, lactic acid, and, and many of the over-the-counter um, treatments, tretinoin is a prescription-grade product. Uh, and this is going to uh, essentially increase cell turnover. So the amount and speed with which your skin turns over is going to be increased by uh, tretinoin. By doing that, you're going to uh, push out uh, fine lines and wrinkles and improve your texture. If you overdo it with the tretinoin, you will get actually scaly and red because you've increased the cell turnover so much. So usually tretinoin regimens are an every other day regimen and a low concentration is probably better than a high concentration. Sun protection, as I said before, these are the active ingredients that you'll see on the back of the um, <clears throat> bottles. Uh, Antioxidation application to the skin is also very beneficial. Um, you, uh, you have to get a high enough concentration of the vitamin C that you're putting on uh, topically. This is really the only antioxidant that's been shown in clinical studies to make a significant improvement in, in uh, texture, uh, uh, sallowness, fine lines, and um, vitamin C is intimately involved in collagen synthesis. and uh, is also known to be an uh, oxygen uh, free radical scavenger. There are other uh, antioxidants on the market that you'll find in certain creams. However, these uh, have not been shown to be statistically significant to offer improvement. Um, <clears throat> bleaching agents are a very um, popular way to adjust the uh, sort of brightness and uh, appearance of your skin. So here's an example of a young lady who has a lot of freckles. When you're young, we call them freckles. When you're old, we call them sunspots. She's sort of, you know, more on the younger side, but uh, obviously has very fair skin, and you can really improve the appearance of your complexion by evening out some of the browns, and this is just uh, a regular application of hydroquinone. There are a variety of light-based treatments out there. We have intense pulse light. There are laser therapies. Um, these things can be used to remove hair. We can use them to uh, remove veins. We can use them to do resurfacing. There's a variety of types of resurfacing out there. There's a blade of resurfacing. There's not a blade of resurfacing. Uh, you can do resurfacing with light-based treatments, as this slide says. You can also do it with chemicals. So there's a variety of ways to do resurfacing. All light therapies essentially work the same way. You're going to push light into the skin, and that light will be um, absorbed by a, a particular target. If your target is hair, then you're targeting the hair fo follicles. If your target is blood vessels, then your target is the blood that runs within those blood vessels. And the idea is that you're going to push in a wavelength of energy that's going to be preferentially absorbed by the target, and it's going to pass through the remaining skin with the least amount of um, re residual damage. And so you are going to um, have a target that you either want to stimulate, contract, or destroy. Uh, photo rejuvenation, um, which is called IPL, um, <clears throat> again, stands for intense pulse light, not technically a laser. Uh, is, is really good at treating photo damaged skin and for treating age spots. It's, it, you can use it to treat telangiectasias, although it probably works better in the browns of the skin than in the reds of the skin. Uh, there's really very minimal to no downtime. Treatments don't last um, very long. You just come in, you get your treatment, you walk out. There, um, <clears throat> so here's an example of uh, facial pigmentation getting improved with IPL. Here's some telangiectasias, these sort of fine vessels. As you can see, definite improvement, but not complete resolution. Here's sun damage on the back of the hand <clears throat> and in the décolletage. 
and for aging. Um, so gravity, downward drift, how are we going to fix that? Well, we have a variety of options, um, and that starts to get to body contouring. So when we do body contouring surgery, we have different components that we surgically manipulate. We can manipulate fat, we can manipulate skin, we can manipulate muscle, and then we have to consider what scars are we putting on the person to be able to manipulate these things. So with liposuction, scars are essentially quite minimal. You're going to get you know, somewhere between one to six tiny stab incisions that we try to conceal in an area that nobody's going to see, and then we're going to try to vacuum out the fat in an area that you don't want it. Um, now, that really doesn't do a whole lot for the skin, and it does absolutely nothing for the muscle. So if you have muscle laxity in an area that's contributing to um, a, a, uh, an appearance that isn't uh, optimal, then liposuction isn't going to do anything for that. If you have a lot of laxity to your skin, liposuction isn't going to really do a whole lot to that. So when you have skin and muscle issues, you have to go to an excisional therapy. And excisional therapy means I'm going to make an incision somewhere. Again, we're going to try to conceal it you know, in an area that the world isn't going to see, but it's still going to be a scar, can be quite lengthy. And, um, uh, but this is the really uh, only way that you can address significant skin laxity issues. Once the skin's been um, manipulated, then surgically, if the muscle needs to be addressed, we can do that at the same time. So again, liposuction has minimal scars. We're vacuuming out fat, minimal skin tightening. Uh, you can use supplemental internal energy sources to break down the fat prior to suctioning. There are a variety of um, machines on the market that surgeons and hospitals can buy. We use the ultrasound machine here, so whenever I do um, liposuction, almost almost always, with rare exception, we're going to use the ultrasound probe first to sort of go in and break up that fat and then go back in a second time around and, and do the vacuuming. There's just the slide talking about doing that. The nice thing about the, the energy um, of the ultrasound is not an all or nothing phenomenon. You can dial up or down the amount of energy that's being put into the area and you can also um, dial up and down if the energy is on 100% of the time all the way down to 10% of the time. So by doing that, you can sort of treat more sensitive areas or, more are or other areas that are actually not sensitive but, but need more aggressive energy attention. So you know, the neck is an example of an area that's fairly delicate. We don't need a whole lot of energy in here, and we just are trying to um, go in and remove this t small amount of fat in here, and realistically, you know, we're t probably talking about an ounce and a half, two ounces of fat in this area, but it's enough to sort of change the contour of your neck. Now, this is not a skin problem, this is a fat problem. What I mean by that, I mean, obviously, she's not a big lady, um, and, and oftentimes, you know, it's the thin patients that are actually optimal candidates for liposuction, okay? It's not a weight loss treatment, it is a body contouring treatment. So here you see, uh, her abdomen and flanks get tightened up. Again, she started good um, by a lot of people's standards. So, um, but here you see a little bit more prominence out here in the love handles before and after. Same person, just from the rear. So you see her flanks are a bit full. Here she is afterwards. Okay, another lady. Again, if you notice, she's got some stretch marks here. I don't know how well it shows up on your slides. Um, over here, you can still see those stretch marks. I mean, those, that is not going to be improved by liposuction, okay? Men oftentimes have a lot of social um, uh, embarrassment about the size and shape of their breasts, and breast tissue is very thick, very dense, especially in the males, so we really have to turn the energy level up pretty high on this area and um, to try to break down that breast tissue so that we can suction it out. Here's another man. Again, some people, you know, would love to have a chest that looked this good, and other people are, are terribly embarrassed by how that looks. And it's not a matter of what's right and what's wrong, and, you know, what's, it's just a matter of uh, really just uh, individual preference. So one person's uh, sort of pathology another is another person's sort of ideal. Um, here's an example of uh, breast and belly on a gentleman, another one. Okay, we have excisional therapies. So excisional therapies, tummy tuck, belt lipectomy, breast lift, arm lift. 
Oftentimes, belt lipectomies are sort of um, done more often on patients who have had massive weight loss. We see a lot of these patients um, because gastric bypass surgery has become so popular over the past, you know, 10 years or so. There's a lot of patients out there who have had either gastric banding or true Roux-en-Roux bypass, and they have had, you know, 100 plus pound weight loss. And you look at them, and you know they're in their 30s, but when you look at their body naked, I mean, they've got skin that's dripping everywhere, and they look like they're 70. Um, here's um, an example, not of a massive weight loss patient, um, but, you know, of a belt lipectomy, so the scar goes 360 degrees around the patient, so you get a tummy tuck in front, it gets continued out to the sides, which will tighten up your outer thigh, and it extends all the way around to the buttock. Um, this operation is a great operation, it has great results, patients love it, it takes a lot of time, and, and it's not cheap, because um, you essentially have to do a tummy tuck with the patient laying on their back, and then once you're done with that, you have to flip them over, and then do the same operation with them laying on their belly. Some surgeons will actually go side, side, you know, and then um, back, um, as opposed to back, front, or front, back. Just a variety of ways to do it. Just depends how many position changes you want in your operating room. Here's an example of three different people who um, had belt lipectomy. These are the, the three befores. These are the three afters. So this is how you're sort of looking at it. Um, Here's a lady who had what we just sort of refer to as total body rejuvenation, so massive weight loss. She's got an abdominal paniculus. She has severe ptosis of her breasts, and so she comes in. She gets a circumferential body lift here at the mid midriff, and she gets a breast lift at the same time. You know, arms. Another area that we take care of. Um, this lady had arms and breasts done in one surgical setting. You know, this operation is a great operation. Patients are very happy with it. The biggest downside is the fact that they ha you have to accept a scar along the length of your arm, um, which is, is easily visible. And, um, but most patients are so unhappy with this that they're like, I'll take anything. I, you know, I don't care if people see my scar. I just don't want to do this, and I want to be able to put a blouse on that I can get my arm in. Um, the massive weight loss patients have really um, redefined where plastic surgeons put scars because we used to be so uh, conscientious about putting scars where people aren't going to see them and people have problems and there's only you know so so many different ways you can do it so if you have a lot of redundant back skin you, know, you may end up with a scar in the middle of your back it, you know so it just sort of depends on are you willing to uh, get the benefits for the for the cost and the cost in many of these cases is a scar um, facial reshaping, face lift, neck lift, rhinoplasty, eyelid surgery, which we call blepharoplasty, brow lift. These are all um, things that we do with regularity. There's a lady who has her face lift done. Um, when we do a face lift, the neck gets lifted. I mean, I think this is just a tremendous example. You know, when I look at her here, she still has pretty severe deflation. She needs volume in the in the mid cheek, um, but. But, you know, this is a terribly aged appearance, and this just looks tremendously better, and I think is a, a really nice result. You can see her entire jawline um, in profile, and, uh, and, you know, just very nice for her. Uh, rhinoplasty is nasal reshaping. Sometimes this is done uh, in conjunction with internal nasal surgery that is done for n nasal airway obstruction, deviated septums, uh, and... Um, uh, turbinate pathology. Sometimes I do these with the uh, ENT doctors, sometimes not. Uh, blepharoplasty, just a fancy way of saying eyelids. Eyelid surgery, we work on the uppers, we work on the lowers, sometimes we work on all four. Again, it's the same principles. We can work on skin, muscle, fat, sometimes some, all of the above, sometimes only some of those. Um, here's a young lady, and she just had a little bit too much extra skin here, so you get a little bit of better um, uh, visualization of our upper lids. Uh, here's lady, same thing. Um, she had lower lids done. She didn't like the appearance of the bags under her eyes. And this is actually done not through a skin incision, but through the conjunctiva. So the lower lid is pulled forward. We surgically access the fat pad down here through the inside of the eye. So, uh, you know, you might call that scarless surgery. There's still a scar, you just can't see it. Um, 
four lid blepharoplasty is when all lids are being done at once, the uppers and the lowers on both sides. So she's got pretty bad lower lids. De definitely improved. Her upper lids have a little bit of droop to them. Okay. Here again, another four lid bluff. Lowers are her. I think the worst feature, but the uppers are greatly improved by her upper blepharoplasty. Here's a lady who, whose brow is low. So um, the brow, in my opinion, has an intimate relationship with the upper lid. And I like to think of it as a roller shade on a window. And I lost my pointer. So the brow is um, uh, low in her case. It rides right on her infraorbital rim. And for a woman, you'd like to see that above the uh, superorbital rim, pardon me. And uh, you'd like to see the uh, brow above the superorbital rim. So we'll talk a little bit about the breast. So what do I do to the breast? I, I make them smaller sometimes. Sometimes I make them bigger. Sometimes we just lift them. Uh, and then, of course, reconstruction. Uh, reduction is something that is covered by insurance most of the time. It will depend on the plan and how big the patient is starting out and how small they want to move to. Um, but symptoms that they often experience would be neck pain, back pain, shoulder grooving, uh, numbness and tingling in the arms, oftentimes a heat rash underneath the breast, which is wor worse in the um, summertime months. So here's just a before and after of a reduction mammoplasty. Small breasts um, or hypomastia, and it's really not small breasts as much as breasts smaller than the patient desires them to be. And I did bring in some breast implants just because they're sort of fun and uh, easy to pass around. Um, these are ones that I keep in my office. Um, there are a couple of different types of breast implants on the market, uh, basically divided into what we would call saline and silicone uh, gel breast implants. Uh, the old-fashioned silicone gel implants were um, uh, taken off the market in 92 because there was fear that they were making women sick. Uh, this turned out not to be the case. You know, those are silicone gel breast implants that are going around. The, and whether it's a silicone breast implant or a saline breast implant, the part that your hand is going to touch either a, a minute ago or to be in a minute, um, the part is the same. So the part that's really in contact with the patient is the same. But in my opinion, there are some fundamental differences of why you might want a saline implant or why you might want a silicone implant. And, and um, you know, I don't make any more or less money selling one kind or the other, and I want the patients to be happy with what they choose. So I just sort of present them with the information that's available, and I, I try to educate them on, on why you might want one or why you might want the other, and help them make a best decision for them. And, and so here are the basics, you know, saline, uh, implants are not a lifetime device. Some of the implants that you're touching right now have been in my office for eight years, and they really look brand new. Um, but they don't get a whole lot of wear and tear. But if you hold them in your hand and you just move them a little bit, you'll see the shell ripples. And when that rippling occurs, every time you breathe, as we know, about 20 times a minute, that rippling is going to occur. And eventually what happens is there's a little bit of shell fatigue and a, a small crack will develop in that shell. So if it's filled with water, if you've ever seen a water balloon with the tiniest little pinhole, the water just starts coming out. Um, and your body just absorbs it. And so I tell the patients, if you have a saline implant and it fails, which it will over time almost for sure, your body is going to absorb that water and you're going to wake up with a flat tire one day. Um, <laughs> you know, it, if you go with a silicone implant, okay, your body can't absorb that silicone. So what's it going to do? It's just going to sit there. And so when the FDA re-released the silicone gel implants onto the market, they had to figure out a way to balance this idea of, OK, so we have leaking that's occurring silently. How are we going to sort of try to protect the consumer, if you will, and the consumer being the lady who's getting the augmentation? So they made a recommendation that said, if you get a silicone gel implant, um, we know they'll leak silently. So after three years, you should probably get an MRI on your implant. And then every other year after that, you should get an MRI on your implant. Now, the problem with that is that for all those ladies who are undergoing cosmetic surgery, I guarantee you Blue Cross and Blue Shield isn't paying for that MRI. Okay, So most women who choose augmentation um, for a cosmetic reason and get silicone implants, they're just sort of sticking their head in the sand, which is fine. Um, but they, they need to know that going into it. Now, if you have a gel implant because you had reconstruction, then I think you could probably get the insurance companies to pay for that imaging study. So I uh, talked about that. So here's just an example of a lady who has augmentation. Breast reconstruction. 
um, is again, after the cancer has uh, been removed from the breast, either the breast has been partially or completely altered, and reconstruction can be done any time after the removal. Um, it sometimes is done the day of the removal, sometimes it's done years after the removal. And there are a whole host of surgical options, and I could probably talk about breast reconstruction for an hour, and since I don't even have an hour today, I'm just going to keep going forward to say that we do a lot of this. There's about 110 cases of breast cancer in the Fond du Lac uh, Cancer Center uh, every year. Um, many of those women get mastectomy. Some of them get lumpectomy. All of them probably would benefit from a consultation, and I'm happy to talk to them at any time, whether that's you know, before they decide to proceed with surgical intervention or, or even years later. Hand surgery um, is another thing that I spend a lot of time doing. I, I do almost, um, almost exclusively soft tissue of the hand work. I, I don't really do a whole lot of bony work. On occasion, I do do some, but almost all of that ends up in the orthopedic office, and that's fine. Um, but things that I do uh, with some regularity is tendon repair, ganglion cysts about the wrist, uh, there are skin contracture disease called Dupuytrens that we see, certainly a lot of trigger finger and a whole lot of nerve decompression. Uh, I'm the only one in the region who does endoscopic carpal tunnel release. I really love it. I think it's a great operation. It doesn't take very long. It's safe. I see better doing it through the scope, and I think the recovery is a bit faster than uh, a traditional open approach. There are ulnar nerve transpositions for people who have cubital tunnel at the elbow. It's a lot more involved and a lot more downtime, but it is a necessary surgery so that you can preserve hand function. I spend a, a fair amount of time doing varicose veins uh, treatments. Uh, varicose veins, um, people have leg pain, leg swelling, which you often see as sock marks, varicosities. Um, this is just a cartoon showing what um, uh, the valves inside the veins of your legs are supposed to work like. So the blood is flowing from your toes back up to your heart. Valves flutter open allowing the flow of blood. Um, gravity tries to pull things back down. Anytime you're standing or sitting, the valves should close. If the, sometimes these valves break, sometimes the veins stretch apart, and then the valves become inefficient. Um, the way we treat this for the large veins, like the greater saphenous vein, the lesser saphenous vein, um, I treat this with endovenous radiofrequency ablation. It's an office procedure. It's done under local anesthetic. It's completely replaced stripping. Um, and there's really uh, no, sig <coughs> no significant activity restrictions, and patients do not go home with pain medication. It's that comfortable. Stab phlebectomy is another thing that we can do for um, superficial veins that are, are serpiginous or quite torturous, and um, we just do, a, again, an office procedure, make a couple of different stab marks, and get this uh, length of vein out of the leg. Uh, we do this fairly often. I did this yesterday afternoon. Uh, sclerotherapy. When you have spider veins, you're going to inject medication into these targeted uh, spider veins uh, and make them go away. Uh, traditionally, uh, you know, 20 years ago, people would complain about how painful it was. They used a very hypertonic saline solution, and it burns like crazy. Now we use a, a detergent, and it doesn't burn at all, and it's quite comfortable and still quite effective. When you do have uh, long-standing chronic venous insufficiency, you can lead to some fairly significant skin changes. I mean, here you see how much swelling this person has. They have skin changes at their ankle and ulceration. Uh, here, another type of uh, skin disorder where you get hyperpigmentation of the skin. And then you can get uh, venous stasis ulcers as well. Okay, skin cancer. Basal cell, squamous cell, melanoma are the three uh, basic flavors of skin cancer. Basal cell is the most common. Squamous cell we see a little less of, um, and you'll see uh, a higher incidence of squamous cell in your transplant patients. Uh, and then melanoma is, is the one we fear the most because it's really the only skin cancer that will go on to kill you. Um, and it can spread in your body through the lymphatic system and end up in places that become inoperable like your brain um, or your bone. Uh, I'm really the only surgeon here in town who treats the more advanced stages of melanoma with sentinel lymph node biopsy and, and um, further treatments. All the patients who have positive lymph nodes will end up for a consultation at the cancer center. Almost no one gets radiation and only a select few will end up on, um, uh, a select few will end up uh, with uh, some sort of medical oncology medication. <clears throat> 
other work that I've done in the past has been some mission work. And um, since I'm sitting with a bunch of healthcare providers, you know, we, we work in a, in a very rarefied part of the world. We have a beautiful building we come to every day. We have beautiful facilities. We have great things. And you don't realize just how tremendous and fortunate we are until you get to do some of this work. So this is um, uh, the hospital that I visited in the Philippines. This is what the patient wards look like. The beds have no sheets on them. Um, the family brings the, the bedding. Uh, the family provides clothing. Uh, it's sort of, you know, sort of World War II barracks-like sort of uh, facilities. You see they've got no uh, windows just go open, um, you know, to get circulation. Here's a scrub sink and the operating room. Uh, the operating room, uh, this was the good operating room. This one has an AC unit in the corner. Okay, the other, the other, the non-good operating rooms, windows open, um, not uncommon to see flying things in the operating room like flies. Um, this is where sterile processing was, and when I first got there, I was completely confused by what this thing was, um, but I do have another picture of it being used in a minute. This was um, labor and delivery. So women would walk down the hallway, lay on the bed, get in the stirrups, have their baby, and then they would walk out. No, no joke. This was a drying rack for gloves. So the gloves that we would bring that we thought were disposable would be reused. So, uh, you know, some of this work that we do in plastic surgery is really engineered to, it, it just works so well as medical missions because, you know, the mouth is not the most sterile environment. And you can't sterilize the mouth. You don't prep the mouth like you prep the belly before you go in and take someone's colon out or something like that. Um, so cleft lip and palate surgery is really uh, a great way to spend 45 minutes of, of your time taking this and, and turning it into that. Um, and, uh, and so that's what I do. Thanks for coming. <laughs>